Aloha and welcome. Welcome to History 241, Civilizations of Asia, Session 24, which is going to deal with ancient Japan, or rather medieval Japan, from about 600 AD to 1400 AD. Uh, my name is Abdul Karim Khan. Uh, please check out uh, WebCT and note down my email and uh, phone uh, number and call me whenever you want to and I will try my best to get back to you as quickly as I can. Also, uh, please go to WebCT and check out the uh, schedule. Uh, if anything, uh, you know, you might have to, any assignment that you might have to take care of. So welcome to History 241 and Civilizations of Asia. Uh, this is session 24, which, as I said, is going to talk about medieval Japan from about 600 to 1400 AD. But before we go into that, let's see what we did last time, sort of a review. Uh, last time we talked about the geography of Japan, how Japan was an island nation, and we compared it, you know, with England and how the Japanese people saw themselves or identified themselves with the Yamato people in the Yamato Plains and how the Yamato people and the Ainu Aborigines and the Korean immigrants, they, you know, coalesced and mixed with each other, uh, and they created the first uh, ancient culture of Japan, the Jamon culture, which was, you know, a primitive sort of Paleolithic culture, and then how that culture, Paleolithic culture, turned into a Neolithic culture, the Yayobi culture, which we said, you know, started agriculture and how then the tomb culture came into Korea, I mean to Japan by the Koreans, how the Koreans brought the tomb culture into the Yamato Plains and we also saw the index of culture going up. Then uh, we talked about Queen Hemiko or Pemiko, as I said you can spell it with H as well as with P and how she uh, used her spiritual religious powers to unite people into peaceful Con, uh, confederacies, tribal confederacies, and she put an end to violence for as long as she lived. But the moment she died, you know, people went on their own ways and starting all over again, their fighting and their problems. So we talked about Queen Pemiko, and from there we got into the Shinto religion of Japan, the national religion of Japan. And as I said, you know, Shinto was never recognized as religion. Uh, up until 1970s, so most uh, world religion books uh, treated Shinto as a sort of spirituality because it did not have two uh, main factors of a religion. One was the moral code that would tell people, you know, do this, this is good, don't do this, this is bad, or the consequences of human action, bad or good action, that is the uh, reward and punishment or the concept of heaven or hell. Since these things were missing in Shinto religion, that's why, you know, scholars did not treat it as religion. But after 1970, because of the economic might of Japan, you know, uh, religious leaders, or I mean the religious professor, they, they said we better include also Shinto as a religion, although it's very much confined to Japan. So that was sort of a review what we did last time. Le now let's see what is going to be the uh, stuff or the material in session 24 that is medieval Japan. Let's see sort of introduction. Uh, today we will talk about the Chinese influences on Japan and the Nara period running from about 710 to 794. And then from Nara we get into the Heian period 794 to 1185. That's a long, long period. And then the decline, how during the Nara period we see the decline of the imperial authority, that is the king's or the emperor's authority would decline uh, because of the rise of the uh, Kamakura shogunate or the rise of these very powerful clans that we will talk about. And the rise of a Kamakura shogunate was the one that started what we now call it shogunate. And how the shogunate was weakened by the Mongol invasions of Japan. So that's a sort of uh, the, uh, and then of course the uh, Kamakura shogunate uh, after the Mongol invasion would be followed by the uh, end of Kamakura but the rise of another shogunate uh, in Japan. So that's sort of introduction, that's what we have in session 24. Now, 
keep also in mind that uh, it would be during this time the medieval Japan that would set the policies for modern Japan up to about 1900 and uh, up to about in fact the you know the middle of the 20th century. Uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, Americans and Europeans and even Asians they woke up to and realized you know how Japan had militarized itself. Well, that military power that we witnessed in the beginning of the 20th century, in fact, was on you know making for all these thousands of years or you know centuries in Japan, and so from this session 24 onward. Uh, observe, keep you know, your, um, your eyes on the rising power of the shogun, the rising power of the military clan in Japan and how they would keep the emperor under their control and how militarism would be part and parcel and violence, political violence would be part and parcel of the Japanese politics. So we would you know, notice that uh, throughout this session. Let's see what we have today. We would start from uh, the history of Japan from about 600 to 900 AD. That's uh, what's called the second major turning point in the history of Japan. And the reason for that was that during this period from 600 to 900, Japanese influences on Jap I mean Chinese influence on Japan increased. And during this period, you see Japan being made in the image of China or Japan, some, I mean, Japanese, uh, you know, uh, emperors and uh, leaders, they wanted to turn Japan sort of a replica of China. So we will talk about that. Also, it was during the Tang Dynasty that all this happened. And Tang Dynasty, of course, you know, very powerful fun dynasty in China. And that was bound to the Tang Dynasty, you know, which was the age, the golden age in China. It was bound to influence the neighbors, Korea and Japan, but more than Korea, Japan got influenced because they fell in love with the Chinese civilization during the Tang Dynasty. This would be something like, uh, you know, in Europe, uh, don't blame the Japanese for taking these heavy doses from the Chinese civilization. This is what happened also in European ancient and medieval history, then when Europeans like the Italians, the French, you know, the Germans, the uh, Spanish, and even the uh, British. They were very much influenced by the Greek civilization, ancient Greek civilization. Even though these people were now, you know, Christians, but they loved the pagan civilization of the Greek people. Why? Because it was very beautiful. It's art, architecture, the sculpture, and especially its intellectual, you know, power, the power of the mind, the power of the free mind. That, that, you know, appealed to European people, not only they adopted, you know, democracy, which was a concept of the uh, Greek people, they also adopted the script of the Greek uh, writing script. So, which became later, you know, from the Greeks it became Latin, and from Latin it became, you know, major European script, and that is our own script, the A, B, C, D, E, F, G. It, it evolved basically from Greek writing script. So this is what happened also in case of Japan. It took almost everything, religion from China. It took uh, administration from China. It took also philosophies from China, as well as the writing script of the Chinese uh, language, uh, which was very incompatible. But you know, th th that type of a Chinese influence on Japan, uh, you would notice during this session. Let's see further. Uh, the writing script, as I said, you know, the Japanese adopted from China. They also took Chinese uh, Buddhism and Confucianism and benefited from it. They also took literature and history of China. It's amazing that some Japanese people, they knew more about the Chinese history than their own islands, and that was because of the heavy influences of Chinese civilization. Uh, let's go into what's called the Yamato period. And the Yamato period, during this period, this one great uh, leader, the Prince Shotoko, from about uh, 6th century to, you know, 574 to 622, this prince, he fell in love with the Chinese civilization. He was just fascinated by the Chinese civilization and wanted to bring China into Japan, you know, which was almost impossible, but he, you know, he, he wanted to do that. So he sent scholars, uh, Japanese scholars, to learn 
bureaucracy, administration, religion, you know, officialdom from Chinese right at the source uh, there in China. So he sent Japanese scholars to learn all this stuff from the Chinese people and bring it and apply it in Japan, which Japanese you know, people would pay a price for that. Also, Prince Shotoko, he promulgated in, you know, sort of uh, under the influence of Chinese Confucianism, he promulgated or he uh, announced or declared the 17 article constitution. And in that constitution, it was not like a constitution that uh, the prince or the, you know, he would live by, uh, like constitution as we know it, the American constitution or the British constitution. It was a constitution which uh, or sort of, uh, a uh, sort of a mechanism or appeal or you know urging people to be peaceful you know to listen to the higher classes to listen to the emperor to listen to their leader so it was that sort of a, a constitution let's see the 17 article constitution of prince shotoko it emphasized social harmony that people should not fight among themselves he also emphasized that Buddhism was the key to salvation, not only in this world, but also in the hereafter. So himself, like, a, you know, very much influenced by Buddhism, so he wanted to bring Buddhism in the lives of common Japanese. He also uh, emphasized on the obedience of law. Of course, Buddhism, and as well as, you know, Confucianism <laughs> taught these people, you know, uh, not to rise against their leaders, but to obey rather than to rise. So that was, you know, under Buddhism and Confucianism. And also asking not only the common people, but also the leaders in Japan to show proprietary, to show decorum, to be nice, you know, among themselves as well as to other people. And under the proprietary, the 17 article constitution of Prince Shotoko uh, urged the ruling classes to live by a sort of a moral model, to become a sort of a morality, model of morality for common people, so that uh, they would learn by moral. This is how we should behave because our leaders behave. So he wanted the, I mean, the leaders to be moral uh, models for lessons for other people that they were going to rule. But don't confuse this 17 uh, uh, article constitution with like, with the Constitution of United States or any other modern constitution. It's just like urging people as a prophet, so to speak, you know, do this, this is good, you know, this would help us to live peacefully and all that. So uh, the constitution, but still, I mean, you know, it was a great uh, idea for a king to promote something, peace and harmony and obedience among the people and trying to his best not to, you know, uh, to keep the people peaceful. So that was a good thing to do. And later on, the Japanese would learn from him and would try their best to live by the constitution. Let's see further. Uh, after Prince Yotoku, you see the rise of what is called, uh, was called Emperor Temu uh, from 672 to 686. Emperor Temu, he got this title Tenno, uh, which is loosely translated as Heavenly Emperor or because under Confucianism, this, he was given this title Tenno that uh, he is the agent of heaven on earth. It's the same old Confucian theory. And so uh, he would be peaceful. He would uh, rule the people like the father of the people, if you remember from Confucianism. So emperor would be the Tenno. He would be heavenly, em heavenly emperor. Uh, not in the sense that he must be obeyed because he is divine. In fact, that is what people got the notion of it. Most of these emperors would be considered divine. But here in the original scheme of things, uh, Teno meant that uh, he is between earth and heaven uh, under Confucian influence. And so he should be rather taking care of the people before he ask the people to obey him. So he should be a dutiful type of an emperor, a Confucian style. So here, but again, uh, from here, now onward, most of Japanese emperors would be considered as heavenly emperors, divine emperors, and they would have supernatural or divinity around themselves. Let's see further. Uh, he was married to Empress Jito, who survived him. And she ruled after him from 686 to 690, 
seven. In fact, his wife, Empress Jito, uh, she was his niece. Uh, Emperor Temu, his brother was worried that Temu would go away from him and would develop problems or difficulties with him. So to bring him closer to himself, his brother gave him his daughter as the wife. So that is why uh, Emperor Temu, he was, uh, you know, uh, sort of a uncle of his uh, uh, wife, Empress Jito. Uh, whether that worked or not, that's a different thing because he died, you know, earlier and uh, his wife continued his uh, lifestyle or his type of a rule, but at least uh, here d d during the transition period, we don't have any problems. So it does seem to be, you know, it worked out that way. Uh, you might, you know, easily can call it uh, incest, but you know, different nations on planet Earth have done that. Even the marriages between brother and sisters, you know, as we noticed, or you might have noticed in ancient uh, uh, Egypt. Uh, similarly, the marriages between first cousin in some part of the world, you know, still very popular. So that's how, you know, here you also see in the case of uh, uh, Emperor Temu uh, marrying his, uh, you know, own niece, Empress Jito. Let's see further. Uh, both imported more Chinese influences. You know, they come under the same period, the Yamato period of Prince Shotoko. So they wanted also to increase uh, Chinese influences in Japan. They gave the J Chinese style. They gave ranks, position, lands to loyal and able administrators, which would create problem, of course. They surveyed land, levied taxes according to the land quality. Uh, they thought that Japan was like China, but China, you know, huge and big. There was no comparison between the two, but they were trying all these uh, administrative policies that you see or changes that you see, these were under the influence of Chinese uh, administration. There is Empress Jito. She ruled up to about 697, and that rule was quite peaceful. You don't see any big problem. Later on, you see a lot of problem in the royal house. Let's see further. Uh, during the Nara period now. Uh, we're still sort of in the Yamato Plains, but Nara period, the, the emphasis is on the uh, Nara uh, capital, that's why. Uh, during this period, we see the rise of ja sources of Japanese uh, history. Uh, one is Kojiki, around 710, which means records of ancient matters was written during this time. And most of uh, the stories, I mean, most of uh, the stuff that is written, Kujiki deals with Japanese myths and stories, myths, very supernatural things, how Japan was created by, you know, angels or goddesses, and the story of Amaterasu and the stories of different ancient kings. Uh, then we have by 720 another, you know, book or source written. Uh, Nihon Shoki, which means the Chronicles of Japan or the history of Japan for that reason. And it deals with much more contemporary events. The names of the person, the emperors or the shoguns or the clan leaders we can easily identify in the Chronicle of Japan. The places that it mentions are easily identifiable to the modern places in Japan. So these two great sources of Japan give us uh, the myths, the stories, the history, you know, of Japan. Now, uh, the Chronicle of Japan also goes into foreign relations, so to speak, uh, Japanese relation with Korea and China, and how the Korean came and helped, you know, Japanese people establishing uh, the Japanese culture, how the Korean brought their own culture, their own technology, so we, we, we can identify easily the people and the places in this uh, chronicle rather than in the previous chronicle, which did nothing but with myths and stories and supernatural beings, the rule of the Kamis, the rule of, you know, Amati Rasu, that type of a stuff. But in the second one, the Onshoki, the Chronicle of Japan, we are much more on a firmer ground of history, although this would be still, you know, some people characterize as prehistory, history before writing in Japan. Let's see further. We're still in the Nara period, and this is when the, uh, they moved the capital to Nara. 
And so that's why the period would be known after Nara. And Nara itself was constructed and patterned on the checkerboard grid of Chang'an, which was the capital of the Tang Dynasty. You see how much the Japanese were impressed by the Chinese civilization. So now they wanted to have this, uh, their capital at Nara to look like the Tang Dynasty capital of Chang'an. So here also the Shouin, these are very powerful big landlords uh, or fief or landholders, they created what's called feudalism. Feudalism mean, uh, it means the rule of the landlords. So from now onward, from Nara period onward, 8th century onward, you would see the rule of the feudal lords in Japan. And these would be very powerful feudal lords. They would, they would stay in power as long as they kept the land under their control. The moment they lost the land, they lost everything. And that's the nature of feudalism everywhere. Powerful aristocracies, which is land-based feudal lords. They received land from the emperor. Uh, they received land uh, from to from escape to escape from this uh, uh, ronin. The ronin were those people who had a small piece of land, uh, but they wanted to escape from taxes. And these were these Ronin, they were called the wave people because they previously did not exist. They went with the wave and the ocean brought them to the shore because they themselves did not have any power in the society. Most of them were peasants. And so these powerful aristocracies got land from these uh, Ronin uh, small landholders who wanted to escape the text. And I would explain it how it worked. Let's see. Uh, during this period also commerce and trade increased because this is now coming more Japanese in contact with the Korean and with the uh, Chinese people and inside the East and South trade was building up inside Japan. Now uh, here is the Nara and that whole place is right here. Uh, this is the Yamato plain right here. Uh, so only Nara would be moved to Heian, we would see later. But this is the Yamato plain where the Nara capital was located. And it was made, as I said, in the image of the Tong dynasty capital, Chang'an. All right, back to the presentation. Uh, during this period, you see the minting of coins for business, which means, you know, business was booming. And there was more business, and so coins had to be meant it to do the business. Uh, also, Nara was uh, connected to the countryside, so there would be easy uh, you know, transportation of goods to the capital, which, was, which population was also increasing. More and more landlord, more and more officers and officials of the state were coming to Nara to settle in the capital. And so they needed all these material that would come from the uh, countryside. Here at Nara, they created ministries. Uh, again, under the influence of the Chinese administration, uh, the number one ministry was imperial household. This was a ministry that would take care of the need of the emperor's house. Whatever the emperor's house, the royal house needed, you know, that would be taken care of through the imperial household ministry. Of course, the treasury and the military in any civilization, culture, or country, the most important ministries or you know, departments that were created during the Nara period. Things are coming slowly and gradually you know, to the forefront. The aristocracies, they control the local people. Uh, that is understandable. And this is what I was talking about, that the Chinese style of administration uh, was coming into being, but this this was nothing but all style, but no substance. And the reason for that was that Japan was very small. Uh, China was very big. So that's why most of the Chinese, uh, you know, uh, administrative features or measures or solutions were sort of useless for Japan. And that's what is called, you know, using an X to carve a chicken. Now, you better use X for a big, you know, animal, not for a chicken. For chicken, use a small, you know, knife. But that, that's just using the X, you know, to carve the chicken. That was the apt uh, uh, sort of uh, phrase 
or adage to describe the whole situation, Japan is a very small, small population, small country, small resources. China is huge, big population, area-wise, resources-wise. So they wanted to mimic, you know, China and Chinese administration, but that was not going to work. And Japanese, you know, finally they realized that uh, the Chinese model was not really a very efficient and good model for them, and they would realize it, and later on they would change it uh, with the passage of time, of course. Let's see further. Uh, new departments were created to curb corruption that was rising in Japan under the Chinese influence. We should not really blame it on Chinese influences, but that's what was happening anyway. Uh, so these uh, new departments that were created to curb the corruption were auditors that they would go and see, you know, who had got how much money and where they spent it. The archivist, uh, archives, that is the uh, records or the books of the different departments and the government to see what were the uh, orders of the emperor and how those orders were implemented and of course the policemen you know, came into being to check upon everybody and so to back up the law of the land through the police force to arrest people or to beat people or to punish people. So here you see, you know, these modern features of uh, civilization or culture coming into being in Japan, the auditors, the archivists, and the policemen, which everybody had it, you know, in ancient civilization. But as I told you previously, Japan started history late, but when it started, it started with a big boom and everything is right there coming up, you know, to the forefront and in the history of Japan working all together. Let's see further. We are still in the Nara period. Uh, during this period, emperors, they were highly respected, they were revered, but they were restricted. Restricted in the sense that they could not, you know, use their power and authority fully to the maximum as they wished and wanted. And why not? Because they themselves were controlled and their courts were controlled by these prominent clan leaders at the court that surrounded the emperor. And so that's why Japan, a small country, you know, small population, uh, and there you have these very powerful uh, leader, clan leaders who own so much land, they control the emperor and the court. This also, you know, in a way, if you look at uh, the history of uh, England, there too, in England, uh, you know, em uh, and the kings of England, they were also controlled by these very powerful, you know, landlords or aristocracies to the extent that if the king did not listen to these leaders, they could even chop their head, you know, the emperor's head, and that's what they did. This is what would happen, you know, quite a few emperors would be assassinated in Japan uh, because of, you know, the internal politics between different uh, clans and their leaders. But just to give you another similarity between Japan and uh, England was that the emperors in these countries were controlled by the powerful feudal lord or aristocracies or the clan leaders in the two countries and that's what was happening also in Japan. So let's see further. Uh, the emperors, they had to share powers with the military and the local aristocracy because he was sort of dependent. And remember, these emperors in Japan, they are, they are much more like divine people rather than militaristic people. So the military part was left to the uh, aristocracies. Powerful clans at imperial court, they would rule almost everything, and these uh, few, uh, some of the uh, powerful clans at the imperial court were like the Fujiwara the Tachiban and the Taira and the Minamoto. These are just only four names of very powerful, you know, clans. And these clans had brought together their people and turned themselves into military aristocracies as they're called. Uh, these clans owned lands and armies. They had their own armies and they could fight each other and that's what would happen in Japan most of the time. Uh, happened and they would wipe each other and that would create a lot of violence but at the same time it also created the need for having the military, the army at all time and a strong level. In about 794, the capital, the emperors, they moved the capital from Nara to Heian and this movement is believed to have been 
uh, the result of this warfare that was going on in Nara in the Yamato, uh, you know, plains. And so he wanted peace, the emperor of that time, and he moved the capital from Nara to Aan. But unfortunately, the politics in the court would remain the same, and the same, you know, problem uh, would follow him. So uh, in Aan, that's a, you know, uh, a place uh, in Japan, and this was renamed as Kyoto. And Kyoto literally means capital city or the capital of capitals. So Heian was later on renamed as Kyoto, and it would be known as Kyoto capital, but we would still refer to it as Heian because at that time that was the name that was used there. So Kyoto and Heian, the same thing, the same place, two names of the same place. Kyoto means capital city. All right, so there is the old uh, uh, capital, Nara, in the Yamato plain. And in the Yamato plain, it was moved to east, I mean to west, uh, in Heian. And so there you have, uh, you know, Heian slash Kyoto. And then it would be moved to another place as we would go into. Uh, and as I said, you know, the reason for the movement of the capital from Nara, Nara to Kyoto or Heian was to have more peace for the emperor, but unfortunately, it would not work. However, what, what did work was that it would be in the Heian period that Japan would become Japan, which means that Japan would not be under so much Chinese influences as it was the case in Nara. Nara was the beginning of the Chinese, you know, I mean beginning of the Japanese civilization, and it started under heavy dose influences from China. But as we go into Heian, those Chinese influences would decrease over time. So that would be, you know, a major uh, sort of uh, new feature in the Heian or the Kyoto uh, period. Let's see. Now, during the Heian period, uh, there come a clan, Fujiwara, under the leadership of Fujiwara Kamatari. Now, keep in mind that in the Japanese system, the first name is the name of the tribe or the clan or the family name. So Fujiwara is the last name, so to speak, in English or American system, although it is the first name, but the first name is always the name of the clan uh, by which the people want to you know, identify themselves. So that's why he would be called Fujiwara Kamatari, and his clan would be called Fujiwara. His rule would be called the Fujiwara period in the history of Japan. So here, uh, Fujiwara Kamatari, he comes to power in the court and he brings other clans under his control and even the uh, emperor uh, himself. Let's see what he did. Uh, he was the founder of the Fujiwara clan. And this Fujiwara clan ruled in Japan, especially in Heian, from about 856 to 1086. Uh, so that's uh, 856 to 1086, you know, close to about more than 200 years. This clan control the court of the emperor and through different ways and means. Let's see. Fujiwara clan, uh, they monopolized powerful positions in the court. Uh, they manipulated the empress through multiple marriages in the royalty, which meant that the Fujiwara clan would ask the emperor to marry, you know, their daughters or the emperor's sons and the emperor's nephews and cousins, they would marry, you know, into the Fujiwara clan. And that is how these multiple marriages in the royal house would be used to empower the Fujiwara clan. Uh, then later on, as Fujiwara, the leader of the clan himself did, he forced the emperor into retirement. Uh, he gave the emperor, the existing emperor, his daughter to marry. The emperor married his daughter, then they had a child, a boy, and so Fujiwara Kamatari told the emperor, now you can go you know, into retirement and your son would be the emperor and Fujiwara Kamatari would be the power uh, behind the emperor or behind the throne. So he forced the existing emperor, you know, young as he was himself, 
to go and retire. So that's how they retired. And this, there is a whole period of retired emperors and they would strike back the emperors. They would try to reassert their power, you know, and gain more power for themselves rather than, you know, out of the hands of these uh, clan leaders. So here, the first instance, the Fujiwara Kamatari, I mean Fujiwara Kamatari, he retired the emperor and set the example for the coming uh, clans and emperors. All right, let's see. Uh, he became himself, as I said, the regent for the minor and adult emperors. And so after Kamatari, other uh, leaders of the clan would do the same thing. They would become the regents for the boy kings or the, even the young uh, men adult kings. So they would be practically the ruler of Japan. And later on, this type of a system would be known as shogunate because the emperor would not be ruled but the shogun, the leader of the clan, would rule. Let's see. Uh, now here, Emperor Shirikawa, a retired emperor, he wanted to assert his power and come back. So he wanted to regain powers through new marriage and economic and political alliances. Uh, he tried his best. He succeeded. He seized the Fujiwara lands. Uh, he reduced the Fujiwara positions in the court so Shirikawa, he sort of gained power, you know, and uh, decreased the power of the Fujiwara, but then he had to rule under someone else. Uh, so this period after him from about 1086 to 1160 is the period of the retired emperors. They would retire but would come back and rule Japan or would do something, some machination, and ally themselves uh, with one or another clan against the existing clan that was in power in the court. All right, uh, the rule of the retired or the new emperors in Heian period, they uh, asserted their authority, as I said, they made a comeback. They replaced the Chinese equal land system during this uh, period. The Chinese equal land system was replaced by fixed tax quotas. What it meant was, China, as I told you, it was a huge, big, you know, land country. So the Chinese emperor, they had given equal pieces of lands to whoever they wanted. And then they asked them to give him equal taxes. From each one, they would give equal taxes because the land was equal in quality and all that. But that could not work in Japan. Japan does not have much land, even land. So a lot of mountains, a lot of hills, a lot of rocks, you know, could not work. So what they realized in the, during the Heian period that this was not a good system for Japan, rather than fixing, I mean, uh, uh, collecting the taxes according to the land, what we should do is just fix the quota of the taxes, telling each governor of each province, this is how much tax you would have to give to the emperor. Send it to the court. Simple as that. It is your problem how you collect that taxes, but this is the order of the emperor that you must give the court, the imperial court, this amount of tax. And so this is called the fixed tax quota because quotas were allotted to different governors and they were asked this is a fixed quota of tax and this is how much you have to pay to the court uh, emperor. Let's see what happened during this scheme. These taxes were imposed on grain, cloth and free labor of the peasants. Uh, these corrupt governors, you know, in different provinces, the military officer and the magistrates, they made fortunes. Although they did send you know, the fixed quota of the tax, but what they did, they collected more taxes, these governor, military officers, and magistrates, they collected more taxes from the people. And so they gave some to the court and kept the rest in their pocket, which is quite universal, you know, problem anywhere in the world. And so this was going, and so it created more and more corruption, but the court was getting, you know, its money anyway from the governors. All right, let's see further. Now the peasants, 
they realized that it was not really uh, beneficial for them to pay all these taxes. So what they did, the peasants commended their lands to powerful lords at the courts. What it means, commendation of land, that some peasants who had been working very hard and at the time of the harvest, whatever they harvested, the crop, they would give the crops, you know, to the local lord, to the local landlord, or whoever there was in charge there, the governor, and then they would have to pay taxes also to the emperor. So with these peasants, they, they, they struck a deal with the local landlords. And these local landlords had position in the imperial court in Kyoto, in Heian. And the deal was that we would give you the ownership of our land so that our land would not be taxed. You own it, and since your position is high position in the court, you are tax exempt. And yes, that was the case. Uh, these several uh, military officers, governors, and other people who had positions in the court, they were tax exempt. So the peasants, they gave their lands to the local landlords that you own our land, we work for you, we get whatever we get, you get whatever you want out of the crops, the harvest that we have, and we don't pay any taxes, and you won't pay any tax because the land is under your name, and your name is tax exempt. And so that's how, that's what's called commendation of land. Believe it or not, the Japanese were, Japanese were not the first to invent this. This had already been centuries earlier invented in China. This type of a corrupt policy or corrupt device had been created or invented by the Chinese peasants. And so that's what the Japanese were doing now. You know, they, they had learned quite a few tricks for, from the Chinese. Let's see further. So these tax-paying lands, the former tax-paying lands now turn into tax-free estates of the landlords. So that's what, what, what was happening. And so, of course, the, the emperor was not going to get enough you know, taxes from people. On top of that, Shinto shrines, Buddhist shrine, you know, these were also tax exempt. And they own a lot of land, these shrines, uh, especially Buddhist as well as Shinto, they own a lot of lands. A lot of peasants would work for them for free, you know. And so they were also tax exempt and the emperor could not take, get any taxes from them. And this would create problem for both Shinto as well as Buddhist leaders and shrines. Let's see if we have some Buddhist temples over oh, right there. Uh, the, I believe that is in Heian, a very old one. This is, I think, uh, the building itself. Another shrine. Just to give you some examples, you know, uh, earliest uh, earliest uh, examples of the uh, Buddhist art and sculpture in Japan. Boy, this one is, you know, huge and big. Uh, the, uh, and still keep in mind that uh, this Buddha, the sculpture, as you can see it from his features, and this one too, I don't know how clearly you can see this one, but this one is still uh, much more the Indo-Chinese Buddha, because later on Buddha, you would see him he would lose his masculinity and would become, you know, a sort of a feminine figure. Also, he would lose his, uh, you know, normal feature. He was a very skinny person, you know, in Gandhara. If you look at the Gandhara uh, sculpture of Buddha, he is almost like a skeleton, you know, because he had almost starved himself to death. So he was very weak, you know, nothing but bones. But here, you know, he resumed when he you know, came to Buddhism, he developed Buddhism, he resumed his normal body. Uh, so normal person, but now from now onward, especially in Japan, he would become very obese or fat type of a, you know, Buddha that would stand for prosperity and good luck and all that. So, but still, this Buddha is still, you know, a uh, Indo-Chinese Buddha with intact features. Let's see further. Still we are in the Heian period, and the period of the retired and new emperors from about 1086 to 1160. Uh, 
here the uh, court changed the Chinese type of a conscription to samurai warriors. Uh, previously, able-bodied men had to be forced into service, uh, into the military, uh, as was the case in Japan, I mean China, so was the case in Japan, but now that found to be not a good system because these people felt to be forced into service and they were not willing warriors. So the Japanese, they adopted their own institution into the military and that is the samurai warrior. Now, Samurai Warrior, we really do not know when this, this system or as an institution the Samurai started. We don't know that. But now in the Heian period, you hear about them more and more, the Samurai. And we don't, you know, previously we did not know much about them because previously nobody had written any history in Japan. Whatever history that had been written of Japan, it was more by the Chinese in Chinese language. But now in the Heian period, you see much more writing by Japanese about Japan. And so that's why we hear more about samurai, but the samurai is not the beginning of this period. It, had, it was already there in Japanese culture, but we hear about him, the samurai warrior, more and more. Let's see. The samurai, the term is derived from a verb samurau. Samurau literally means in Japanese language to serve. And of course, the service is reference to the military service. And from samurai, we get the term noun samurai. These were warriors from, warriors from local noble families. So again, everybody could not become a samurai. They had to come from noble families. And the, the reason for that was they had to pay for their own weapons, for their horses and their own training. It took a long time to train a samurai. And if you were training you know, yourself in a samurai system, you could not do agriculture. So of course one cannot be, could not be a peasant family person. All right, here is some of the stuff, gadgets or, you know, uh, for samurai, a helmet and in full you know, combat gear, the samurai. I think we have a few other things, the sword of the samurai, as you know, they would be so much known the samurai sword for and the legend that they could even cut a flying fly, you know, with it. That's sort of, you know, the uh, expertise in the use of uh, the uh, uh, sword. And so let's see, uh, under the new emperors or the retired emperors in about 935 to 940 for five years about, uh, there was a revolt. And so, uh, the, in the east of Japan, uh, east of Japan was, like, uh, you know, it's also called like uh, the uh, wild east of Japan. Uh, there was a revolt on part of uh, certain clans and that was crushed. The emperor of the time crushed a military revolt in militarized east Japan. And as I said that, uh, you know, the military in the wild east, they were very powerful people. Why the east of Japan was so wild? because more of the wild uh, tribes or tribesmen, they lived in the east of Japan. So that is why uh, most of these clans and leaders, they had been told to stay in the east and protect the center and south. That is Heian and the Nara place or the Yamato plain or the Kanto plain, protect them from the eastern barbarians. So that would be something like, or think of Rome, and Rome always being bombarded and invaded by barbarians from, you know, northeast. So was the case also with Japan. And so that's why in the east, there were more militaristic type of people because they had been exposed to fighting against the tribes who lived further east up, up, up to about Hokkaido. So that's why, and they produce very powerful clan, military clans. Let's see. Uh, during this period, so these military, they were posted against the northern tribes uh, and they interviewed in imperial court affairs. These military, you know, people or military clan, they intervened, intervened in the internal affairs of the emperor's court. They meddled in war of succession because they wanted their guy to become the emperor. And so there were other military clans who wanted their person or prince to become the emperor of Japan, 
which is not really a new thing in Japan. It was also in China, you know, in the later day China, also the same problem you have. Uh, different clans and different military officers trying to impose their prints on China, and in this case now in Japan, to become the emperor so that they would reap benefits and enjoy, you know, life under their emperor. So they would intervene in war of succession. Uh, internally, quite a few emperors were killed because the rival group did not like them. They were killed so that another emperor would become the emperor of Japan. Let's see. So all that stuff that was happening in China was also happening in Japan. Okay. So in, from about 1156 to 1180, another group of people, I mean, not a group, but a clan, the Taira clan, they emerged into power victorious over the Minamoto clan. And there was a fight between these people. And so the result was a Taira clan, you know, came to power. And now they would, you know, rule Japan. Uh, they controlled the royal family, again, through the old system of marriages. They would ask the emperor and his sons and uh, uh, cousins and whoever, you know, in the royal family to marry from the Taira family. And that's what they did. Uh, in about 1185, the clan rivalry intensified uh, between Taira and other clans. And there were quite a few contenders to the throne. Each clan had their own prince to become the emperor of Japan, so that's why several contenders. Most of these people came from the royal family, but they were fighting among themselves. Another problem is uh, with Japan, just like in China also, that uh, Japanese emperors had uh, a few legally wedded wives, but they also had a lot of concubines. A very common practice in throughout uh, Asia, and so was also in Japan. So here in Japan, also the emperor having multiple women, you know, and multiple children. And so each woman having, if she had the power or the support of her clan behind her, she could potentially, you know, bring her son into power with the help of her clan and make him the emperor of Japan. And that's what happened in 18. Uh, 1185 that the clan rivalry intensified and it also intensified rivalry in the imperial house who would become the next emperor of Japan, that sort of a rivalry. Let's see. In 1185, the imperial civil authority transferred to these very powerful military clan leaders and they would be, be the virtual or effective ruler of Japan. There would be a lot of shifting of alliances and loyalties within the clans. And so you would see a lot of violence, a lot of killing, you know, not only of the members of the imperial house, the emperor's house, but also the killing on, uh, between and massacre between uh, emperor, I mean clans. So you would see a lot of violence, political violence. Clan leaders and samurais, that would be the one who would gain power because the clan leaders, they were needed as political leaders and samurais were needed as military officers or the warriors. So what you would see in Japan from 1100 onward, uh, throughout the medieval period, what you would see Japan, two things, two people, two groups of people coming to power. One, the leader of the clans, especially the one who had the greatest military might under their control. That might was dependent upon how many people, able-bodied people they had under in their clan. If they did not have many able-bodied men, they could ally themselves with another clan or with the second or third or the fourth or the fifth, and all these clans could get together to make a good army of the samurai. They would pull together, you know, their samurai warriors, and through that they could wipe out the existing clan that was ruling in Japan and had the control over emperor. So now they would control the emperor and they would be, 
you know, the power behind the throne or the shogun or the virtual ruler of Japan. So keep in mind the rise of the clan leaders and the rise of the samurai as a military class. Let's see further. Military power uh, allowed the emperors to reign but not to rule. So these powerful military clan, they would let the emperors go ahead, sit there and reign and just live there, but do not rule because the rule belonged to the uh, clan military leaders. So that is why, you know, from now onward up to the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century, uh, the emperors did not have any power. And, you know, that's how in, during the Second World War, when Japan lost the war to United States, uh, Emperor uh, Hirohito, you know, uh, there were uh, among the Americans some leaders who wanted him to be hanged, uh, you know, but there were other people uh, at that time and they said, look, this is an emperor of Japan. He is loved and revered, but he really did not have any power in Japan. So he did not give this order to the military to go and bomb Pearl Harbor. So we should rather go after those military commanders who bombed Pearl Harbor and hang them. And that's what they did. American hanged quite a few, you know, military, strong military uh, leaders in the Japanese Imperial Army. But the emperor was saved because he did not have the power, he did not have the authority to initiate this war. Maybe he himself was, you know, a prisoner in the hands of these very powerful military families, and that's what we are talking about now, but that's what we would talk about even later in the middle of the 20th century, the same thing would happen. So that's what it's called. In Japan, the emperor reigned. He was just there, but did not rule and did not have the power to rule because the power to rule belonged uh, uh, and was in the hands of the military clans and their leaders. Let's see further. Now here comes a Kamakura shogunate, another family, uh, uh, under the leadership of Minamoto Yoritomo, very powerful person. Minamoto uh, was the clan that he belonged to and so this would be the clan name would be first and that would be the surname of all the Minamoto people. So Minamoto Yorotomi, the leader of uh, the next leader and the most powerful leader that would emerge, uh, you know, of the Kamakura Shogunate. Uh, he imposed his own Bakufu or tent government at Kamakura. Kamakura was a place in the Kanto Plains uh, further east of Nara and Heian in East Japan. And this Bakufu, uh, sort of a new institution that he introduced, what is loosely called the tent uh, government, and I would explain that what it meant at that time. Uh, the tent government it meant was that uh, rather than for him to live in the court close to the emperor, he would have someone to live in the court close to the emperor to watch him and watch other clans and their machination and, you know, schemes, he would, he would not live in the court. He would live far away from the emperor in another place, in a tent, military tent. Well, it wasn't a tent. I mean, he had his own palace, but it was referred to as Bakufu, the tent, because it would not be like the capital where the emperor was living. So this, but don't take it literally, the tent. Uh, this was a palace, in fact, under the shogun, and he would take, you know, he would become like his first shogun. Uh, so here, uh, the uh, Minamoto, Yoritomo, he becomes the shogun, but he lives outside the court, and that's the reason he was going to be very powerful now. Uh, let's see further. Here is Nara and Kyoto, and then there is the Kamakura uh, capital, and this is the Kanto Plains, and very poor, I mean, wonderful place because it had a lot of agriculture. So that's the reason uh, that he was so much powerful because he had controlled agriculture under his, you know, and so that's how uh, he would go. Okay, let's see further. We are still in uh, Minamoto Yorotomi area. 
period, he seized power on behalf a rebel prince. What it was, there were quite a few princes, you know, uh, each one wanted to become the emperor of Japan. So there was this one prince who asked for his help, Minamoto Yorotomi's help, to help him gain the throne uh, so that he would become the emperor, and that's what he did. Uh, and so that prince was up against the Tara clan. They had their own emperor, so, but this emperor, he wanted to become the emperor, and hence he pitched Minamoto clan against the Tara clan. Uh, he was also supported by this new, emp I mean, the prince uh, under the Minamoto influence. He was supported by other samurais, other clan, because of the Minamoto Yorotomi's own personality. Very strong person, and other samurais wanted to work under him or fight under his, you know, command. So he declared himself a shogun. A new terminology, but shogun meant, you know, a powerful clan leader but he would be the real power in Japan from now onward. Uh, from about 1200 onward, they would, you would see the rise of the shogunate or the power of the shogun or the rule of the shogun. So you would have in Japan two personalities, one the emperor and the other the shogun. And so the emperor would be at the imperial court and the shogun would be somewhere else in a safe place from where he would control entire Japan. And that's what you see, uh, beginning with Minamoto Yorotomi, that's what you see uh, going on. So he, Minamoto Yorotomi, he declared himself the shogun of Japan. Let's see further. Rise of Japanese feudalism. So he did bring his guy, his prince, to power. Uh, so he had to you know, give lands as a reward to loyal supporters other clan leaders. He had to uh, support them. And he created vassals that would be landlords under his control. So as you would see in Europe, these vassals would be landlords under the control of the king. But here in Japan, these vassals would be the landlords under the control of the shogun. And so uh, he made the shogun, made these vassals dependent upon him and upon his shogunate. So that's how things would now work on. So if you wanted to keep you know, power or the land in your control or the governorship of a, power, a governorship of a province under your control and within your family, you better be on the good side of the shogun. You better serve him very loyally. But here things were you know, uh, a little bit different in the sense that loyalties did change. Uh, he would give land for military service to anyone who was capable of the military service, which meant any clan who had a large body of able-bodied men, they would get a land, and that piece of land in English is called fief. So here is the rise of a true Japanese feudalism, which is the rise of the uh, vassals in the fief and the fiefdoms. Now, the samurai, because of the changing loyalties of there, they had to be held to this code of honor called Bushido. Bushido was the warrior's code of honor, and the reason for that was why they had to live by their own code. Because in the code, first thing first was that the samurai had to be loyal to his lord. The, in this case, you know, one shogun or another shogun. So if the samurai, a group of samurai, they were given power, land, by one shogun, they had to be loyal to him. And that is the Bushido co code required them. If not, then they would be traitors and liable to be killed. And of course, the next shogun would not, you know, trust them. So trust, loyalty, service and sacrifice these were would become these would become you know the uh, the ruling factors in the life of a samurai and that's what it means the bushido court let's see samurais let's see further samurais were held to bushido warriors court all right we are still in kamakura shogunate and so in about 9, 1199 
uh, Minamoto Yorotomi, he died, and his wife or widow, uh, which is referred to as the nun shogun, what happened was his widow became a nun, and this was a practice among powerful Japanese uh, clans that at the death of the person, his powerful wife would be stripped of all power that she had, and she would be asked to go and join a Buddhist or a Shinto shrine, and there she would become a nun. And that's what happened to also Minamoto Zurutomi's widow. She became a nun. However, uh, this nun was like no other nun. She still controlled everything from her, you know, uh, Shinto or Buddhist shrine. She turned against the Minamatos and brought her family, her clan, the Hojo family, Hojo clan in power, and the Hojo controls the emperor uh, through her, through the nun shogun. And so she turned against her husband's clan, the Minamato clan, and she brought her clan, the Hojo clan, into power, and now they would control the emperor. Their power, however, that is the power of the Hojos, was weakened by Mongol invasions of Japan. So the Mongols are coming under Kublai Khan, as we talked about them, and so this clan would be weakened, and uh, you would see the rise of another clan. But remember, I mean, the point that a lady, a widow, you know, could do all this, bring her own family into power, also tells you that women in Japan did have power, political power, and they could make or break, you know, emperors, or they could bring their own sons to become emperors, or their own family to monopolize the power in Japan. Let's see further. So now the Mongols are coming. In about 1266, Koblai Khan demanded the Hojo emperor to appear in his Khan Balik uh, court or uh, capital, which is or was Beijing. So he, the Koblai Khan ordered Hojo emperor to come and appear before him, and that would be to pay tribute to the Khan, uh, bring gift, and that is the, I mean, that would have been like a symbol that the Hojo emperor, you know, accepted the authority of Koblai Khan of China. The Hojos, they resisted. They were powerful people. They resisted, and rather than, you know, appearing at the court, uh, they beheaded, the Hojus beheaded the Khan's envoy and sent his head and body to the Khan, that is Koblai Khan, and that, of course, infuriated Koblai Khan, and so he would invade Japan quite a few times. So uh, they, they had to prepare themselves because they knew that Koblai Khan would be coming, the Mongols would be attacking, invading Japan, so they strengthened the Hakata Bay walls, which were closer to Korea. Let's see. Here are samurais, they're defending the Hakata Bay. Uh, this is, the, these are the walls, and here are the samurai, and here are the Mongols invading, you know, the Hakata Bay, and they want to scale. They did scale, but here were so many samurais that the Mongols, you know, were just butchered right there the moment they, you know, crossed the wall or scaled the wall, and they would be butchered by the samurais of Japan. This was a great defeat for the Mongols and a great victory for the samurai class, and that gave them more power. Here are samurais fighting the Mongols. You know, the Mongols had come in, in ships, and some, you know, samurais, they even boarded these Mongol ships. Most of these ships, as, uh, if you might remember, uh, were uh, plied by, uh, you know, Chinese and Korean sailors. In 1274, about 30,000 Mongol troops invaded Japan but they had to go back, withdraw because of the nature of the, uh, I mean, the fight of the samurai, as well as the season was not the right season for the Mongols to invade. Finally, they invaded in 1281, the last Mongol invasion, and a huge and big, look at that, 140,000 Mongol soldiers. They invaded Japan, and the samurai defeated them. That was the greatest defeat for the uh, uh, Mongols, and they were defeated, of course, by, you know, samurai, but the defeat was ascribed to the Kamakazi wind. Remember that holy wind 
the typhoon that just came at the right time and drowned most of the Mongol soldiers, and that wind was called the Kamikaze wind. And also, in the Japanese literature, this defeat of the Mongol was made possible by Buddhist shrines and the Buddhist monk. They prayed against the Mongols and for their Japanese emperor and the samurai, and that is how, because of the Buddhist prayers, the Mongols lost the war, and that, you know, Buddhist uh, prayers brought this typhoon, Kamakazia, the holy wind, and destroyed the Mongol uh, army. And that's, that would be the end of the Mongol power, uh, and the Mongol would never dare to invade Japan. Let's see what we have. The decline of the Kamakura shogunate, uh, and because of the Mongol invasions, you know, the Hojo power had weakened and non-Hojo vessels or clan leaders, they resent, resented the Hojo's monopoly over power. And in 1331, uh, one emperor Kogan, uh, he turned against the Hojo clan. Uh, he didn't want to rule under their control. And so he turned against the Hojo clan and he was helped by another clan called the Ashikaga clan. And that clan would, of course, you know, fight for their emperor against the Hojo clan. A Chicago Takauji, uh, another great, um, you know, military warrior and leader. He changed loyalties. He was loyal, you know, previously to Hojos, but he saw the chances of his family coming into power under another emperor. He changed loyalties and joined the forces of Emperor Kogans against the Kamakura. Shogunate and Kamakura Shogunate came to an end thanks to, you know, the loyalty of the Ashikaga people. And so that's how uh, from uh, now onward the Kamakura Shogunate would be in power. Now what, what you just saw is one clan, you know, followed by another clan. In Chinese history, one dynasty being replaced and followed by another dynasty. I think we did a lot today, but keep in mind again, the rise of the militarist people and military power and military clan, the samurai, and this rise of militarism and violence in the history of Japan. And so that, that would be the, you know, the message of uh, today's uh, presentation. The Ashikaga Bakufu, the same old system, uh, they created their own people called daimos. Daimyos mean very powerful local landlords. Of course, they had to give them, you know, land, and through land they gained power. So daimyos, another terminology coming into being, uh, very powerful landlords. And they, they created different uh, multiple system state or regional states in the country. The military, the political, you know, the uh, economy, the taxation and all that stuff was uh, under the Ashikaga. Uh, I think we got into conclusion. Uh, we talked about Prince Shotoko, uh, we talked about the Nara changes and the Chinese institution, the Heian emperors, how they lost power and the rule of different clans in uh, Japan and how the Mongols, you know, ended the Kamakura clan uh, rule. I think we did a lot today and thank you very much for tuning in and aloha.